Hello everyone, welcome to Mass Media Class 8. I'm your professor, Dave Eccles, and today we're going to be talking about broadcast TV. Later on, we will be talking about public TV, cable TV, and news TV. <clears throat> so, we have a lot of TV to talk about, and let's get rolling. Television really became radio with pictures. A lot of the radio programs that were on in the classic era of network radio in the 30s and 40s, uh, sometimes they were sitcoms, sometimes they were dramas, and when television came along, a lot of them just transferred over to television. They had to get sets and things. A lot of the sitcoms, they would just need a living room and a kitchen set, something like that, maybe an office set, but Sometimes they shot the same exact scripts that they had been using back in the uh, network radio uh, classic days of radio programs. So uh, the three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, become three television networks, and we have radio with pictures. And just like radio, the networks, the television networks, radio and television networks really, had stations that they owned and operated, O and O's, and they had affiliates in a little over 200 markets in the country. And these affiliates could be in small towns in uh, Iowa or Michigan or uh, uh, Montana, and they could get all the top-notch television that could be produced in New York or LA or something like that. So uh, that is really the big advantage with network TV. You get top-notch production, in uh, small towns, so it's not just local local TV. So who invented television? Well, Philo T. Farnsworth, there it is. And he should be as well known as Thomas Edison or you know some of the other great inventors that we have. Uh, and he's got a great name, Philo T. Farnsworth, very cool. Uh, and he invented television uh, in the 1920s, he got some of the key ideas for the way the, uh, the uh, tubes and so on would work and the scanning guns. Way back when he was in high school, he wrote a paper in a high school science class. And uh, years later, when he was in court and defending copyrights and things like that, his high school science teacher brought his paper in and said, see, he had, he had these ideas way back, uh, way back when and uh, they are original for him. So uh, NTSC, the National Television System Committee, uh, and, uh, became the U.S. standard. Now there were other standards in other parts of the world, so until HDTV and streaming and all that stuff came along, uh, television, uh, televisions and television programs and VCRs and all that stuff didn't work all around the world. Um, uh, Europe had a different system and different parts of Europe had different systems. France had a different system than uh, Great Britain did and uh, Japan had a different system than China did. It was, uh, there were about four different systems and uh, there was no one standard. Finally, the U.S. standardized in 2010 with HD TV. That's the one we all are familiar with today on our wonderful flat screens and so on, but television up until the early 2000s was mostly tubes. Tubes, just like radio, tubes. He's, that's a big tube that he's holding there in his hand, uh, and so it was a whole different kind of, uh, kind of uh, device there. Uh, early computers were tube-driven also, right? Early, early computers before uh, transistors and all that stuff came in. So uh, this is an early television control knob uh, for different channels, and there were VHF, not VHS like the videotape, VHF, very high frequency, and UHF, ultra high frequency channels. VHF came along first, so most people that were watching TV in the late 40s and most of the way through the 1950s would have just this knob on most of their TVs, channel 2 uh, uh, through 13. 
right there, there's a little UHF uh, thing, and so you'd have to turn your TV to UHF. And then down here, you would do a second tuning. And now you're trying to find channel 28 or 56 or something like that. So you would actually tune it in kind of like a radio. Uh, it wouldn't click into place. Here in LA, Southern California, we have channels over the air. This is over the air, not, not cable or streaming, but over the air, 245, 7911, and 13. And you'll notice, aside from uh, 4 and 5, they're not right next to each other. Uh, and that would cause interference. I don't know exactly about uh, 4 and 5. I'm sure it has to do with, uh, with uh, frequencies and that wonderful electromagnetic spectrum that we talked about in radio. Uh, but if you go to San Diego or if you go to Palm Springs or Santa Barbara or Las Vegas, that's where you're going to find channels uh, 3 and 6 and 8 and 10 and so on. Early movie studios really resisted TV, and then they first they ignored it, and then they, they resisted it, they fought it, they told their stars, you are a star of the big screen, the silver screen, and don't go on TV. Uh, it will diminish you as a, as a performer and as a star, a movie star, and all that. And really pretty short-sighted. We've talked about this, I think, a couple of times in class, about how short-sighted a lot of established uh, industries are, whether it's uh, the established uh, film industry or the established uh, television, they're going to be short-sighted when it comes to cable and they're going to be short-sighted when it comes to streaming. So a lot of industries are really short-sighted. Uh, and um, boy, the people that run those companies make a lot of money. You'd think they'd be a little smarter, but not so much. So Alfred Hitchcock, and Walt Disney were among the very, very few in the movie industry that embraced early TV. That would be in the, in the middle 50s or so. And Alfred Hitchcock had a show, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. We saw uh, some of that when we talked about movies. And uh, Walt Disney had a show called Disneyland. And he was looking for investors for his new theme park. And his brother Roy didn't want to take the money out of the, out of the movie studio. And so Walt had to go out uh, with uh, um, his ideas to try to persuade. And mo nobody at the uh, movie studios were interested. And when he went to the television networks, uh, the third, the brand new television network, ABC, which was which was spun off of NBC Blue. Remember, NBC had two radio networks, NBC Red and NBC Blue. The court said that's too much, and they made them spin off uh, the Blue Network. That became ABC, and they didn't have uh, so many stars uh, under contract. They didn't have as much programming. They were the perennial third-place network, and they told Walt Disney, sure, if you can provide a show for us every week, then uh, we'll invest in your uh, theme park. Now, strange but true, now the Disney company owns ABC TV along with ESPN and lots and lots of other stuff, uh, but back then uh, they had to go hat in hand, as they say, to uh, ABC and ask for investment. So uh, he named his show Disneyland. It's kind of almost like a a uh, promotion for his new theme park. And I've linked to a wonderful YouTube uh, clip of that show, of the Disneyland show. And oftentimes he would uh, repurpose Disney, uh, Mickey Mouse cartoons and, uh, and bits and pieces of Fantasia uh, and so on. But he also had some quite popular brand new television shows, original television shows. He had uh, Davy Crockett, and that was a huge hit. Uh, in the 1950s. Uh, little kids had coonskin caps and, uh, and Davy Crockett tents, all that kind of stuff. It was a big thing uh, for little kids in the 50s. And they had a couple of other shows uh, that were also pretty popular. Um, but uh, uh, Walt, uh, he really 
um, he really thought color was the way to go. And uh, the live action stuff was okay in black and white, but the idea of showing a Mickey Mouse cartoon, or especially Fantasia, on TV in black and white, it just really uh, irked Walt. And um, so uh, when it was on TV, when Fantasia was on TV, it was, it was in black and white, and that's just really, uh, that's really a, a, a big loss. Um, so when Walt got the chance, when the contract was up after four or five years, uh, and other networks came calling, Walt went to NBC, and and the show uh, was called the Wonderful World, the Wonderful World of Disney, I believe is the is the full title, and it was in color, and NBC uh, uh, w was doing a lot of color because their parent company was RCA, and RCA wanted to sell color TVs. So that's why NBC's logo is a peacock. It's a it's a a graphic. It's a little hard to tell these days, but it's a it's a peacock, and that's because they were showing uh, color and pushing color very heavily. And sometime this year, I believe uh, NBC Universal is going to launch a streaming service, and they're calling it Peacock. So there you go. And uh, so check out. The uh, Walt Disney uh, hosting, uh, the Walt Disney hosted Disneyland, and he's going to talk about his uh, new theme park down in Anaheim, and you get to see uh, some nice aerial photos of Anaheim full of orange groves and not much else, and uh, you don't have to watch the whole episode, but it's kind of fun to watch Walt uh, talking about his new theme park. Also, uh, the very next year, he had an after-school show called the Mickey Mouse Club. Uh, you might be familiar with the new Mickey Mouse Club that uh, Brittany and Christina and Ryan and a few other uh, current uh, movie and recording stars were on when they were kids, when they were, I'm guessing, 11, 12, 13, something like that. Um, and uh, you can, uh, you can uh, check that out too. But the original Mickey Mouse Club ran for years, it was very popular, uh, and uh, five days a week, right after school. So I think it was on at three or four o'clock. Uh, when the way people thought back then was that mom would be a housewife, and uh, in the afternoon she would be watching soap operas. And then when uh, the kids came home from school, mom would go in the kitchen and start cooking dinner and set the kids down in front of the TV to watch the Mickey Mouse Club and then dad would come home and dinner would be served in the news and, uh, and television. That's the way a lot of people thought families would be back in the 1950s. I don't know how often it was uh, really true like that. But anyway, um, that's uh, uh, the Mickey Mouse Club after school and uh, five, uh, five days a week. Uh, and it was an hour, so a lot of programming coming out of, coming out of Disney. Here's uh, some nice 1950s. I'm sure these kids are posed. I don't know that anybody would uh, sit quite like that. But it's kind of close uh, to the way, you know, well, it's definitely the way televisions looked back then and uh, representative of these two uh, little white uh, kids, of course, for a stock photo like this, eating a nice healthy sandwich and a glass of milk. <laughs> Um, so uh, when you look through stock photos, uh, trying to fill in, trying to put in photos for your PowerPoint lectures, and you uh, have 1950s TVs, uh, you're not going to find too many uh, people of color uh, in those in those stock photos. That's certainly not the way you would today. Anyway, uh, there's another very cool TV there on the right. Uh, I had a, I still have a friend whose father owned an appliance store, and. He had one of those TVs. I th he probably still does uh, somewhere, I hope, nice and safe. It looks like it's worth some money for sure. Anyway, a very cool TV, but TVs would be kind of like furniture, really, with legs and so on, uh, and sometimes big speakers below and, and all of that. Just like radios. Radios were big, too. A lot of some of those radios that we looked at in the, in the radio class, that, you know, they were, they were uh, big hunks of 
mahogany and uh, they had uh, legs and cabinets and big speakers and, and all of that. Uh, when television came in, interestingly, uh, in a lot of uh, households, the radio was picked up and moved somewhere, and then the TV took that same spot, uh, that, that same favorite spot. And um, even though we, we don't really watch radio, generally we turn our heads toward where the sound is coming. So, you know, the radio would be on one part of the room, and the uh, sofas and chairs and so on be sort of facing the radio. And usually a chair would be right next to the radio so that somebody could uh, change the change the channels, change the stations. And so when TV uh, came in, uh, as I said, often uh, the radio was uh, the radio was just picked up and moved somewhere. Uh, and uh, and then the TV got that uh, favored spot in the living room. There's our NBC Peacock. Okay, so that's a, one of the older logos, and I see a, a DVD player, looks like, or maybe uh, maybe it's a combo unit with, uh, with uh, VCR, DVD combo there underneath the TV. Uh, but uh, CBS and RCA developed color TV. NB, NTSC uh, went with RCA because it was compatible with existing black and white TVs, and that was... Uh, important and good for them, really good for them for uh, sort of um, uh, standing up for consumers. There were a lot of televisions out there and for the government basically to say, throw your TV out, it's not going to be any good as of January 1st, you have to buy a color TV and uh, they didn't do that and good for them and so the TVs that came out had to be had to be uh, compatible with uh, existing black and white TVs, and it took all the way till 1973 before half of Americans had color TV sets. So it took a little while. It was uh, developed in the right in the middle 50s, and um, 17, 18, 19 years before even half of people had color TVs. Uh, they were pretty expensive. And a lot of people didn't really mind black and white. A lot of television shows were still in black and white uh, through uh, the years. Uh, NBC was pushing color real heavily, so a lot of people were watching NBC shows uh, in black and white. Uh, the Disney show and Bonanza and Get Smart and The Monkees and all those shows that were in color. I remember they uh, pushed real hard uh, to get a color TV around Christmas so that you could watch The Rose Parade in color. There was an NBC executive named Pat Weaver, Sigourney Weaver's father, as it turns out, and he developed 90-minute programs like The Today Show and The Tonight Show uh, in the early 50s, 52, 53, and part of that is because advertisers were calling a lot of the shots because they were basically supporting, sponsoring uh, a television show. And if they pulled their sponsorship, a uh, television show would go off the air in many cases. Uh, and for radio, uh, a lot of programs were 15 minutes and 30 minutes, and so one sponsor could afford to sponsor the entire program. And if they lost their sponsor, uh, Chase and Sanborn coffee. A lot of the sponsors' names were in the names of the show, the Chase and Sanborn Hour, uh, and, and so on. So uh, they were, the, the sponsors, advertisers, were calling uh, a lot of the shots, and uh, that's going to be a bit of a problem when we get to the TV, to the quiz show scandals uh, later on. Uh, but in order to lessen their impact, Pat Weaver develops these two 90-minute programs five days a week. That's way more than any one sponsor can sponsor or advertise on. So that's when we start getting multiple advertisers for television shows and lessening the power and the impact. And uh, I'll tell you, the sponsors, they could insist on uh, a, certain, a certain amount of censorship, too. And I just found out about this uh, kind of recently, but... Uh, a lot of television programs were 
segregated, just like, just like the country was segregated, uh, with African Americans uh, sitting in the back of the bus, uh, and, uh, and thanks to Rosa Parks and her, her efforts, uh, and uh, um, not allowed uh, to sit in restaurants. Sometimes they could get takeout food uh, in movie theaters. Of course, they would sit uh, in the back or maybe up in the balcony, something like that. And, uh, and mostly in the South, but little bits of the North too, but most of that was happening in the South. And so when television was uh, on in the 50s and even into the 60s, there would be uh, African Americans on TV programs and Southern TV uh, station executives uh, were not happy with uh, with uh, that. At one point, it was rather startling, a black performer held hands with a white female performer. And that was outrageous to uh, many people, sadly, many people uh, in the South and sponsors threatened to pull advertising and that sort of thing. We don't want to lose our southern uh, networks and so on. So uh, they they backed down in a lot of cases. Um, and uh, if a sponsor pulls uh, advertising, then sometimes the network will have to run a show with no advertising. Sometimes the networks actually have a spine. Uh, some of this stuff happened during the days of uh, early gay people appearing on TV uh, that certain summer and shows like that, a young, a young boy just finds out uh, that his father is, is gay and so on. And uh, sponsors will refuse to advertise. They, they don't want to be boycotted by, uh, often in the South, not always, but often in the South. So uh, the whole idea of sponsors, advertisers having power uh, over TV programming uh, is um, it's it's really startling and it's very sad and it goes all the way back to the earliest days of TV. That's Johnny Carson uh, there, and he was uh, the longest host of the Tonight Show, and the Tonight Show ran from 11:30 to 1 a.m. Uh, for its early years, and uh, Johnny. Uh, got so powerful in the uh, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s that he could uh, demand more time off. And the show went from 90 minutes to 60 minutes. And uh, then uh, the, he decided he didn't want to do a show on Friday. So uh, he was powerful enough that uh, and, and the show was was a, a big uh, boon uh, for uh, making money. It made tons and tons of money because it didn't cost all that much to put on, aside from paying Johnny a very sizable contract. Um, they didn't really have to pay uh, much for sets and all that other kind of stuff, so he could uh, he could call the shots. Uh, anyway, uh, the Tonight Show was on for a uh, it's still it's still on it's still on for a very long time. But uh, Johnny was the third host. Uh, Steve Allen was the very first one. Uh, he had it. Well, not very long, I think three or four years. Jack Parr, uh, I think about five years or so, maybe five or six, something like that. And then uh, by 1962, about 10 years in, uh, Johnny uh, was uh, plucked off of daytime TV and uh, to host it. And he lasted until the early 90s. Uh, and then uh, the uh, Jay Leno, who was hosting... The show after The Tonight Show uh, was moved in. There's a whole long story about was it going to be Jay Leno or David Letterman. Um, actually, Letterman is the one that had the show after after Johnny's show. Sorry, uh, uh, The Late Show with David Letterman. But Jay Leno had been doing guest hosting and all that sort of stuff. And the network thought that Dave was a little too out there. Uh, David Letterman, and the college kids liked Letterman uh, and so on, but they didn't think that Letterman was uh, a good fit for uh, middle America, as they called it, uh, and they thought he was a little too cutting edge. So um, we get that odd uh, Jay Leno, uh, and then Conan O'Brien with an asterisk there because he was only technically the host of The Tonight Show for about five or six months 
at one point NBC, in a huge mistake, decided that they were going to save money because Leno was so popular. He was very popular. He's beating being out Letterman quite pop quite handily, and they would give him the ten o'clock hour from ten to eleven o'clock. Jay would do his talk show, and NBC would save tons of money. But uh, it was just a bad decision. The show didn't uh, have uh, very high viewership, and the affiliates complained vociferously uh, because the 10 o'clock show leads directly into the local news. And if there isn't a strong lead-in, if there isn't a strong lead-in to the local news, then that newscast will lose uh, viewers, and thus the local station will use advertising money, and the dominoes started to fall. So NBC uh, made a quick reversal on that. Um, really, Jay and Conan were sort of caught in the middle. Uh, I suppose Jay could have said, no, you gave the show to Conan. I'm not going back to 1130. Uh, but he didn't. He loved uh, he loved uh, the show, and he loved stand-up and still does stand-up in, in Vegas and places like that. Uh, so he allowed uh, the network to give him the show back. And Conan was paid off quite Quite handsomely, he had, he got a big a big uh, multi million dollar uh, go, uh, golden parachute, uh, big kiss off, uh, and then Jay got the show back, and uh, did it for another ten years or so, and now Jimmy Fallon is the current host. He moved the show uh, back to New York. It was it started in New York. Johnny moved it to Hollywood. He liked Hollywood. He had lots of showbiz Hollywood friends like Bob Hope and people like that. And uh, Jimmy decided to uh, move it back to New York. Okay, a lot more maybe than you wanted to know about The Tonight Show, but it is uh, really an iconic American show. There have only been those five, six hosts in 60 years, 60, 65 years. Uh, so uh, it really is, um, of all the late night shows, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty popular. And, uh, and uh, the one that started it all off, really, the talk shows really started it all off. In the 1950s, there were anthology shows and leading into the golden age of TV. And an anthology show has different characters every week. So it's not a show like uh, like Friends where you get the same actors and actresses or I Love Lucy every week uh, playing the same characters. Anthology shows are sort of like little plays or little playlets uh, for often 90 minutes or so. The anthology show that most people know, well you might know uh, Black Mirror and before that there was The Twilight Zone. And, uh, and there are a few other shows uh, like that. Um, Steven Spielberg is resurrecting his anthology show. And I'm drawing a blank on it. It'll come to me. Uh, strange? Is it strange in the title? Well, anyway, um, there are a few anthology shows, and they're bringing them back. Uh, but they were very uh, big in the 1950s. Partly why they call it the golden age of TV. There's some nice big 50s television cameras and a, and a uh, live studio audience that looks like Desi Arnaz, so that's probably an I Love Lucy show there. Uh, and like radio, uh, early TV was live from New York. Radio was live from New York for the most part, live from New York, and TV being radio with pictures uh, also came live from New York. And so there are certain shows that you can do live. Game shows are okay to do live. Uh, sitcoms you can do live. You're not going to get uh, some big, like, you can't do action, uh, something like that. You really can't do a, a um, an NCIS uh, a type show or a X-Files or a, or a Western or any of that kind of stuff, really. There's certain shows that you can do uh, indoors with uh, three or four cameras and certain shows you can't. Uh, for sports, 
interestingly enough, there was a lot of, of boxing and wrestling uh, because it was a little bit easier to do those inside. Basketball was kind of big. They, basketball was not a big thing in the 1950s. Uh, football, you, they could do in uh, on uh, the afternoon, on Sunday afternoon, in daylight, uh, but the cameras weren't so good that they could do night uh, night games. Same goes with baseball. Um, baseball didn't even have night games until, until quite a ways in. And if it was going to be on TV, it definitely wouldn't be at night. So how did they uh, show shows to Californians three hours earlier than in New York? When it's when it's eight o'clock in New York, it's only five o'clock in California. The, the, the time zone difference. And what they did was kinescopes, and a show was was shot with television cameras, and and uh, sent across the country on wires and antennas and whatnot on a, on a kind of a secret uh, signal here that wasn't going out over the air. And when I got out to California, they would take a 16 millimeter film camera and point it at a monitor and film the, the live TV show that was coming from New York. So they're filming live TV and the TV cameras weren't so good back then. Film had a nice high resolution, but uh, television cameras were not so good, and they would uh, film it and record the record the sound to rush that film to the lab to process it, and then they would uh, project the film into a television camera, and then that television camera would rebroadcast it out over the airwaves in Southern California. In California, so it's it's kind of odd, right? So it's it's. TV cameras, and then filmed, and then processed, and then TV cameras shooting the film, again, uh, to broadcast out over the air. Uh, so uh, those are called kinescopes. Those are called kinescopes. Um, and there's the root word, kinny, like cinema. And um, so today, uh, most of the stuff that we have from live TV are kinescopes. It doesn't look that great, um, but uh, it took a while before uh, before videotape came along. And speaking of videotape, it was invented in 1956. I don't know how old this machine is. I don't think it's uh, it's from the 1950s, but they were big machines. Uh, it was two-inch tape, so nothing like VHS or anything like that that you might uh, think of for videotape. And um, they could do, uh, like, they could rebroadcast the news and they could, uh, uh, you know, game shows and things like that that they could do if they wanted to save it. It took really a while for videotape to uh, get a high enough quality to be really, really useful. Uh, and sometime, I believe, in the 1970s, the technology was finally developed that video could do slow-mo. And that was really huge. That was really huge for sports in particular. So now, especially in, uh, and playback too. So uh, slow-mo and playback, instant playback they called it. And so if a play had run, uh, then they could uh, show different uh, camera angles. They could do slow-mo maybe of a, of, a, of a runner sliding into second base or uh, a, a runner running down the field and uh, until they get tackled or make it to the end zone. So uh, when videotape got some bells and whistles on it, it uh, really became much more useful. First, the quality went up, but then uh, instant playback and slow-mo really helped uh, videotape become uh, much more useful and very, very popular, especially in sports. In early TV, there would have been 39 episodes, just like radio, 39 episodes a year. And so there would be three chunks of 13 each, right? So they'd run 13 weeks and then time off for Christmas and so on, and then 13 more weeks and 13, and they'd take time off in the summer. Uh, sometimes there would be separate summer programming, but uh, three chunks of 13 is a lot. Now for radio, 
you're just going in, you're reading your script, uh, you're not building all those sets, you're not memorizing all those lines, it's not that big of a deal, and there's lots of singing and so on. But for television, uh, really just putting a lot into it, uh, like I say, memorizing all the lines, writing all the scripts, uh, building all the sets, all that kind of stuff, uh, it really became uh, uh, just a real grind. So it has been limited down to, down to uh, uh, slowly but surely, 36 and 33, 28, 22, 24. Right now, uh, for network TV shows, and there are still some out there like The Simpsons, right? Some shows like that, or Modern Family, and, and so on. Uh, even Friends and Seinfeld from a few years ago that you probably know. Um, they're down to about 22, 23, 24 new episodes per year. The TV season, as it's called, these are some business terms, um, but uh, the television business and the entertainment business and the film business, these are uh, good careers. So if you're looking for a career path, uh, it's a pretty good career. The season runs from September to June, and it turns out that September was uh, chosen because the, auto, uh, the automakers wanted to introduce their new cars in September for the following year, and they wanted to be able to advertise them, and they didn't want to advertise on, on reruns or summer programming or something like that. TV uh, viewership is called uh, ratings. Um, and so uh, how many people out of how many households, right, out of, uh, you know, 300 million uh, or 200 million households that we have today with the people in it and... So you put one number of total households and how many TVs are watching your program, and that's how they get uh, ratings and shares and all that technical stuff. And there are, as uh, we know, over 200 markets in the country, and so it would just cost too much money to do uh, ratings every day or every week for all 200 markets. So. The uh, ratings companies, I'll we'll talk about ratings in just a little bit, uh, they will do the top 50 markets, which is really most of the country. When you, when you get all the top 50 largest markets, that's a, it's a big chunk of the country right there in terms of population. And they have picked uh, November, February, and May. And the reason for that is uh, November was picked because it comes after the World Series, and the World Series was kind of a disruption, uh, maybe an unfair advantage for whichever network had the World Series. February was picked because it's after the holidays, December and January uh, uh, holidays and that sort of thing, so February was, was picked a couple months later, and then May, uh, right before the uh, end of the, uh, the television season. And so even today, uh, a lot of shows, like Modern Family, something like that. I know it's going off the air, but uh, shows like that. They do their big guest episodes. They do the wedding episodes and uh, maybe the family vacation episodes. They do the big episodes during sweeps to get as many people to watch those shows as they can, especially during the sweeps. So the sweeps are about 12 or 13 weeks, and... Today, they're only doing maybe uh, another 10 or 11 or 12 episodes. They're only doing maybe 24 episodes. So the sweeps are eating up um, most of that, two-thirds of, two of the original programming. Uh, so over the years, we, uh, television shows would, would have uh, a couple of new episodes in September, and then they'd already go into uh, rerun, and then they'd run four new episodes in November and so on. And a lot of people just got tired of so many reruns that uh, television programming strategies started to change uh, where they would do uh, six or eight or ten in a row and then sort of go on hiatus for three or four months. Uh, and they'd sort of wrap up their storylines and things. And then, of course, with streaming and all that, it's, uh, it's changed even further. Primetime is TV's biggest audience, 8 to 11. And finally, here we are in the modern era, and we see a uh, diverse family 
uh, as I said earlier when I was going through uh, looking for photos to put into the PowerPoint slides. I didn't find too many people of color watching TV in the 1950s, uh, but here now we get into the modern era and, um, and uh, the file stock file photos are reflecting our uh, new sensibilities, which is, which is very nice. Scripted original programs, and it does not include news or sports. Okay, a scripted original program. I believe it includes like reality TV because reality TV is is semi-scripted, heavily edited. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I believe that uh, reality type TV shows, uh, Survivor and uh, the, uh, the Great Race and all that stuff um, are uh, called scripted shows. But uh, it's amazing that in just about 10 years or so, uh, there have, they have gone from 210 scripted original programs, and most of those would have been on four networks. So if a network is running uh, maybe four shows per night, maybe a couple of half-hour shows and a couple of hour shows, maybe four or five shows uh, per night uh, times seven, so somewhere around 30 or 35 programs per week per network times four, so that's maybe 120, 130, 140 uh, scripted original programs on the four networks. So 210. Now we see today in the neighborhood of 500. In the neighborhood of 500. So that's astounding. Really astounding in just 10 years or so. Thanks to Netflix, thanks to Hulu, thanks to all that. 500. Uh, I probably am going to reference that number. That's... Um, Kind of important, 500 original programs on all platforms, as they're called, all platforms, uh, streaming, cable, network, over the air, all that. Don't worry about all these numbers. Don't really don't worry. Uh, don't worry about memorizing them or all of that. I just want you to kind of get the, the the big picture. And this is a, a couple of years old. Um, the, the 2020 stuff isn't quite out right, so this is uh, out now, but this is really, these numbers are about a year old. Um, but we see it's about a third, a third, and a third. That's the main thing, the main takeaway. Streaming is about a third, broadcast about a third, basic cable about a third, and then HBO Showtime and all that um, is, uh, maybe, you know, like 10%, something like that. So uh, pretty evenly distributed. Streaming, broadcast, uh, and cable. So only six streaming shows in 2011. And uh, now 163. And the biggest streaming services by the end of 2020, Netflix, Disney Plus, HBO Plus is coming out soon. Um, I'm not sure. I th yeah, they're going to call it HBO Plus. That's going to be uh, they're owned by Time Warner, so uh, it'll be sort of a lot of Warner Warner Brothers stuff. That's all the DC stuff uh, and so on. Hulu, Peacock, as I mentioned earlier, that's the NBC one. CBS. All access. That's where you're going to get your your new Star Trek stuff, and uh, of course Amazon Prime. So the story of syndication. The story of syndication. This is a big part of TV. This is where the really the big dollars are. That's for sure. Big, big multi-million, hundred million, millions of dollars. So the story is, CBS wanted movie star, 
Lucille Ball. She had been making movies since the 30s, the late 30s, and through the 40s, and now it's uh, 1950, and they wanted her to be in a, a TV show. She'd done some radio work. They wanted her in a TV show. She wanted her husband, Desi Arnaz, uh, and he's Cuban. They weren't uh, uh, particularly happy about that. Uh, he looks like he's of uh, European extraction, for sure. He's definitely uh, not a person of color, as they might say, like uh, many other Cubans are. He wouldn't be uh, uh, termed uh, brown or, uh, or black or anything like that. But he spoke with a thick Cuban accent. In the 1950, the, the network wasn't very crazy about that, but Lucy uh, put her foot down. Uh, Ricky was a band, uh, or Desi was a band leader, and like people in bands uh, throughout the years, uh, they go touring around. Sometimes they have girlfriends uh, that come up to their rooms and things like that. Lucy had been hearing stories of uh, uh, some hanky-panky, let's call it, with, uh, with Desi. And she wanted to keep him uh, a, closer, a closer watch on uh, Desi. So she wanted him uh, in, uh, to be on the show, too. And they uh, uh, wanted to stay in L.A. They liked L.A. She was, a, she was a, a former movie star in Hollywood and all that. And they liked the idea of staying in L.A. So, and the Pacific Time Zone, they can't really shoot it live. Okay, remember New York would be three hours later. And so they were going to have to use film. To do that. And it's not the first show to be filmed with four film cameras in front of a live audience. Uh, most television shows are, are done with television cameras in front of a live audience, but, uh, but film wasn't unheard of. But it was one of the first, definitely one of the first shows to be filmed in front of a live audience. It was going to cost extra money for all the film and the processing. CBS didn't want to pay for it. Desi and Lucy picked up the extra cost of the show, paid for all that so they could, so Ricky could be, or Desi could be in the show, it could be from L.A., and they would end up owning the show, which didn't seem like that big of a deal, but it became a really big hit, the top hit of the era. So at one point, there was a gap in the schedule, and CBS had the contract to show uh, uh, an old episode. They, got, they, they had the contract to rerun a previously shown episode. They thought it was just a strange idea uh, to show something. It had already been on. People had already watched it. A lot of people had already watched it. Who would want to watch a TV show again? It's like, who would go back to a movie again? Okay, you, it played in the theater. People went to the theater and they saw the movie. Who would go back again? That's the thought. And a lot of people did, as it turns out, want to see old episodes of Lucy, just like people wanted to see their favorite movies over and over again, too. Uh, thus, uh, VHS and DVDs and streaming and all the whole rest of that. But uh, that's in, a bit into the future. This old episode did very, very well. As a matter of fact, it had a bigger audience than the original episode did. And Lucy and Desi owned that show. They owned the show and they thought, wow, if it's going to do that well for CBS, then uh, we can package these up. Okay, We can package these shows up and sell them to uh, kind of our own network, a, a syndicate. Right? We can, we can sell them back again. In, in batches of about 100 or so. So in TV syndication, about 100 is a pretty good uh, number. Um, a lot of syndicated shows are run five nights a week, Monday through Friday, maybe at uh, 7 or maybe at 11 or something like that. So you, go th you burn through the episodes pretty fast. And so uh, it looked like 100 would be a, a pretty good number. And so when a television show is on the air for uh, four or five years, these days, uh, that's like hitting the jackpot in Las Vegas. Now you have 100 episodes in the can, as they used to say when it was on film, and now you can syndicate your show and really make 
armfuls, gobloads. To imagine a giant cement truck backing up and just dumping out money. Okay, so syndication, that's really where a lot of money is. That's because a lot of TV programs don't even make a profit until syndication. They are, they are sort of put out at a loss. And if you have a hit show like Seinfeld or like Lucy or Friends or something like that, then the stars are going to start making more money. They're agents and they are going to ask for more money. And so shows are going to run uh, uh, in the red for a while. They're gonna, it's going to be a deficit for a while, and if they can get up to that 100 episodes, if they can stay on the air till 100 episodes are, are done, then they can make a huge, huge profit. But a lot of shows, not every show, but a lot of shows go uh, into, the, uh, into the red. They lose money really until they can get into syndication. And syndicated shows are, are shown and packaged for hundreds of millions of dollars um, I believe Seinfeld package for streaming was five hundred million dollars. Wouldn't be billions. Five hundred million dollars, I think it was. Yeah, something like that. Five hundred million, six, seven hundred million. Really, hundreds of millions of dollars. An awful lot of money. And so stars like Jerry, not the, the rest of them, did just fine. Okay, the rest of them did just fine, but Jerry as a part owner of the show and uh, a lot of shows that have the star in the title, uh, maybe like Frasier or something like that or Drew Carey, uh, if you have one big star of the show, a lot of times they are uh, part owners of the show and have profit sharing. And so when it goes into syndication, then they make way more than their salary ever, ever gave them. So there are two kinds of syndication, off the network, okay, off net, and I'm going to contrast real quickly here, hold on, I'm going to come back, and first run, okay, first run are brand new shows, off net are shows that were on networks, and so in the case of this show here, Friends, it was on NBC. NBC affiliates and owned and operated shows could watch it, but uh, no one else, uh, no one else could. But when it goes into syndication, then everybody can, uh, everybody can bid on the show, right? They can bid on the show, and uh, and uh, Friends is another uh, example of a show that's uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars off the network, so off net syndication. Friends, Seinfeld, Simpsons, all that stuff, Big Bang Theory, those are off net. And first run syndication are new shows, a lot of the game shows, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, Judge Judy, Ellen, Oprah, those are new shows. Those are first run, but they're syndicated. They don't appear on networks. So those are the two. There's only two. In programming, and this goes a little bit for movies too, there is the term counter-programming, where you put on shows that are sort of uh, different. If, if somebody is into football, they might not be into um, Riverdale or something like that. Um, and so comedy versus drama, male skewing shows, um, mostly would be like sports and things like that, female uh, skewing shows. Uh, uh, dramas, sort of nighttime soaps, things like that, uh, and, uh, you know, young versus old, documentary, like um, uh, like 60 Minutes, Nightline, things like that, versus comedy or drama. So if somebody's into one, maybe they're not into the other, so you would put up your show opposite that and counter-program that. Some shows appeal to older people, younger people, all of that. So that's counter programming. And movies will do this too. If a big superhero movie is coming out one weekend, then maybe 
um, there will be a small little independent film, maybe a Meryl Streep movie, who knows, something like that. It's kind of a program, it's kind of a counter-programming people that aren't into uh, the big, loud, action, Fast and Furious type movies. Maybe they want a uh, smaller uh, drama or musical or something like that. So that's called counter-programming. And then there's challenge programming where uh, maybe you put on a couple of shows that are kind of similar. You put on two uh, police procedurals. Uh, maybe you put on Hawaii Five-0 and uh, NCIS or something like that. Or 60 Minutes uh, uh, versus um, uh, Nightline or one of those, uh, 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 Dateline or one of those types of shows. Two comedies, right? Two comedies against each other. Um, Young Sheldon and uh, I don't know what. Friends or something. I know they're not on together, but that would be a challenge, right? Our comedy is better than your comedy. And then finally, uh, a hammock. If you have a big, strong show, if you have a big, strong show uh, like uh, Survivor was for a while, or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, or, um, or Friends was for a while, or Seinfeld, shows like that. Uh, if you have two strong shows, NBC for a while had Seinfeld and Friends, they could put uh, Friends on at 8 and Seinfeld on at 9, and then they could put a brand new or week show at 8.30. And the idea was that you would have a bit of a hammock, and you could put your, your untested week new show between the two big hit shows, and it would probably do well. Probably do very well. Okay, so a little bit of uh, the business there, of, of scheduling and all that, and I know that uh, that there's cable and I know that there's streaming and all of that but surprisingly a lot of this still kind of holds true a lot of people still watch network TV um, a lot of people don't record it on DVRs or anything like that uh, shows like uh, uh, shows like uh, uh, young Sheldon or or modern family or NCIS they still pull in a lot of a lot of viewers and they still make a lot of money for the networks uh, so some of this um, strategy uh, is still in play. It certainly was a very big thing in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, right? So for, for 40 years or so, it was a very big thing, and much less so now. Uh, the same thing with sweeps and all that. A lot of this is kind of uh, going by the wayside, uh, first with, uh, with uh, cable and then uh, with, with uh, satellites and streaming and so on, and we will be talking about both of those coming up in uh, the very near future. Until then, we're signing off with uh, uh, broadcast TV. What you might notice that a lot, of, uh, a lot of broadcasting hasn't really changed since the days of radio. Uh, there are still sitcoms, there are still dramas, there are still soap operas, there are still kids shows, there are still news shows. Uh, mostly they're either 30 or 60 minutes long. And so much was set down in the 1930s. So a lot of, even, even affecting um, streaming, right? How long shows are, 30 minutes and 60 minutes and so on. So a lot of, a lot of the way the world is today, uh, the entertainment world is today for sure, came out of uh, old time radio and early TV, early uh, TV, live TV and all that. So, um, Maybe not a whole lot of change, but we're going to find out when we get into cable and, and uh, streaming and all of that in a future class. Until then, Professor Eccles signing off. I like that. I need a better catchphrase. <laughs>